The Call of the Wild Chapter 3, Part 2 The first day they covered 35 miles to the Big Salmon. The next day, 35 more to the Little Salmon. The third day, 40 miles, which brought them well up toward Five Fingers. Buck's feet were not so compact and hard as the feet of the Huskies. His had softened during the many generations since the day his last wild ancestor was tamed by a cave dweller or river man. All day long, he limped in agony, and Kemp, once made, lay down like a dead dog. Hungry as he was, he would not move to receive his ration of fish, which Francois had to bring to him. Also, the dog driver rubbed Buck's feet for half an hour each night after supper and sacrificed the tops of his own moccasins to make four moccasins for Buck. This was a great relief, and Buck caused even the wizened face of Perrault to twist itself into a grin one morning when Francois forgot the moccasins, and Buck lay on his back, his four feet waving appealingly in the air, and refused to budge without them. Later, his feet grew hard on the trail, and the worn-out footgear was thrown away. At the Pelly one morning, as they were harnessing up, Dolly, who had never been conspicuous for anything, went suddenly mad. She announced her condition by a long, heartbreaking wolf howl that sent every dog bristling with fear, and then sprang straight for Buck. He had never seen a dog go mad, nor did he have any reason to fear madness. Yet he knew that here was horror, and fled away from it in panic. Straight away he raced, with Dolly panting and frothing, one leap behind. Nor could she gain on him. So great was his terror, nor could he leave her, so great was her madness. He plunged through the wooded breast of the island, flew down to the lower end, crossed a back channel filled with rough ice to another island, gained a third island, curved back to the main river, and in desperation started to cross it. And all that time, though he did not look, he could hear her snarling just one leap behind. Francois called to him a quarter mile away and he doubled back, still one leap ahead, gasping painfully for air and putting all his faith in that Francois would save him. The dog driver held the axe poised in his hand and as Buck shot past him, the axe crashed down upon Mad Dolly's head. Buck staggered over to the sled, exhausted, sobbing for breath, helpless. This was Spitz's opportunity. He sprang upon Buck, and twice his teeth sank into his unresisting foe and ripped and tore the flesh to the bone. Then Francois's lash descended, and Buck had the satisfaction of watching Spitz receive the worst whipping as yet administered to any of the team. One devil das Spitz, remarked Perrault. Some damn day, him keel dead buck. Dead buck, two devils, was Francois' rejoinder. All the time I watch dead buck, I know for sure. Listen, some dem fine day, him get mad like hell. Then him chew that spits up and spit him out in the snow. Sure, I know. From then on, it was war between them. Spitz, as lead dog and acknowledged master of the team, felt his supremacy threatened by this strange Southland dog. And strange Buck was to him, for of the many Southland dogs he had known, not one had shown up worthily in camp and on the trail. They were all too soft, dying under the toil, the frost, and starvation. Buck was the exception. He alone endured and prospered, matching the husky in strength, savagery, and cunning. Then he was a masterful dog, and what made him dangerous was the fact that the club of the man in the red sweater had knocked all blind pluck and rashness out of his desire for mastery. He was preeminently cunning and could bide his time with a patience that was nothing less than primitive. 
It was inevitable that the clash for leadership should come. Buck wanted it. He wanted it because it was in his nature, because he had been gripped tight by that nameless, incomprehensible pride of the trail and trace, that pride which holds dogs in the toil to the last, which lures them to die joyfully in the harness and breaks their hearts if they are cut out of the harness. This was the pride of Dave as wheel dog, of Solix as he pulled with all his strength, the pride that laid hold of them at break of camp, transforming them from sour and sullen brutes into straining, eager, ambitious creatures, the pride that spurred them on all day and dropped them at pitch of camp at night, letting them fall back into gloomy unrest and uncontent. This was the pride that bore up Spitz and made him thrash the sled dogs who blundered and shirked in the traces or hid away at harness up time in the morning. Likewise, it was this pride that made him fear Buck as possible lead dog. And this was Buck's pride too. He openly threatened the other's leadership. He came between him and the shirks he should have punished, and he did it deliberately. One night there was a heavy snowfall, and in the morning, Pike, the malingerer, did not answer. He was securely hidden in his nest under a foot of snow. Francois called him and sought him in vain. Spitz was wild with wrath. He raged through the camp, smelling and digging in every likely place, snarling so frightfully that Pike heard and shivered in his hiding place. But when he was at last on earth and Spitz flew at him to punish him, Buck flew with equal rage in between. So unexpected was it and so shrewdly managed that Spitz was hurled backward and off his feet. Pike, who had been trembling abjectly, took heart at this open mutiny and sprang upon his overthrown leader. Buck, to whom fair play was a forgotten code, likewise sprang upon Spitz. But Francois, chuckling at the incident while unswerving in the administration of justice, brought his lash down upon Buck with all his might. This failed to drive Buck from his prostrate rival, and the butt of the whip was brought into play. Half stunned by the blow, Buck was knocked backward, and the lash laid upon him again and again, while Spitz soundly punished the many times offending Pike. In the days that followed, as Dawson grew closer and closer, Buck still continued to interfere between Spitz and the culprits, but he did it craftily when Francois was not around. With the covert mutiny of Buck, a general insubordination sprang up and increased. Dave and Solix were unaffected, but the rest of the team went from bad to worse. Things no longer were right. There was continual bickering and jangling. Trouble was always afoot, and at the bottom of it was Buck. He kept Francois busy, for the dog driver was in constant apprehension of the life and death struggle between the two, which he knew must take place sooner or later. And on more than one night, the sounds of quarreling and strife among the other dogs turned him out of his sleeping robe, fearful that Buck and Spitz were at it. But the opportunity did not present itself, and they pulled into Dawson one dreary afternoon with the great fight still to come. Here were many men and countless dogs, and Buck found them all at work. It seemed the ordained order of things that dogs should work. All day they swung up and down the main street in long teams, and in the night their jingling bells still went by. They hauled cabin logs and firewood, freighted up to the mines, and did all manner of work that horses did in the Santa Clara Valley. Here and there, Buck met Scotland dogs, but in the main, they were the wild wolf-husky breed. Every night, regularly at nine, at twelve, and three, they lifted a nocturnal song, a weird and eerie chant in which it was Buck's delight to join.
with the aurora borealis flaming coldly overhead, or the stars leaping in the frost dance, and the land numb and frozen under its pall of snow, this song of the huskies might have been the defiance of life, only it was pitched in minor key, with long-drawn wailings and half-sobs, and was more the pleading of life, the articulate travail of existence. It was an old song, old as the breed itself, one of the first songs of the younger world in a day when songs were sad. It was invested with the woe of unnumbered generations. This plaint by which Buck was so strangely stirred. When he moaned and sobbed, it was with the pain of living that was the old pain of his wild fathers and the fear and mystery of the cold and dark that was to them fear and mystery. And that he should be stirred by it marked the completeness with which he harked back through the ages of fire and roof to the raw beginnings of life in the howling ages. Seven days from the time they pulled into Dawson, they dropped down the steep bank by the barracks to the Yukon Trail and pulled for Daea and salt water. Perot was carrying dispatches, if anything more urgent than those he had brought in. Also, the travel pride had gripped him, and he proposed to make the record trip of the Daea. Several things favored him in this. The week's rest had recuperated the dogs and put them in thorough trim. The trail they had broken into the country was packed hard by later journeyers, and further, the police had arranged in two or three places depots of grub for dog and man, and he was traveling light. They made 60 mile, which is a 50 mile run on the first day, and the second day saw them booming up the Yukon well on their way to Pelly. But such splendid running was achieved not without great trouble and vexation on the part of Francois. The insidious revolt led by Buck had destroyed the solidarity of the team. It no longer was one dog leaping in the traces. The encouragement Buck gave the rebels led them into all kinds of petty misdemeanors. No more was Spitz a leader greatly to be feared. The old awe departed. They grew equal to challenging his authority. Pike robbed him of half a fish one night and gulped it down under the protection of Buck. Another night, Dub and Joe fought Spitz and made him forego the punishment they deserved. And even Billy, the good-natured, was less good-natured, and why not half so placatingly as in former days? Buck never came near Spitz without snarling and bristling menacingly. In fact, his conduct approached that of a bully, and he was given to swaggering up and down before Spitz's very nose. And we're going to stop here and continue on this chapter in the next video. Till then, thank you so much for watching. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now. I love you guys. Bye-bye.